Would you open your Bibles with me again to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 22 to 26. Jesus healing a blind man at Bethsaida. And I've titled the sermon this morning, I can see clearly now the trees are gone. Follow along with me as I read from verses 22 to 26, and then we'll jump right into it. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. There are many causes of blindness today that we know about. Of course, congenital blindness, being born blind, macular degeneration, infections of the cornea or the retina, glaucoma, uh, not getting seeing or eyeglasses on time, the prescription that you need, and even cataracts, actually. And cataracts are a degenerative disease that destroys the lens in your eye. Normally, the lens in your eye is clear, and this causes it to cloud up, and there's varying degrees of it. It, it can get worse. You can develop it later in life. You can even be born with a cataract, severe, opaque cataracts. But cataracts is actually one of the most easy eye diseases or causes of blindness to treat. See, there's surgery for it. There's surgery where an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, can actually remove and take out that cloudy lens that the cataract has destroyed and clouded up and, and caused your vision to blur and replace it with an artificial lens. An intraocular lens, they call it, because it's implanted into the eye, intraocularly. And what's interesting about cataracts in particular, and even this procedure, as easy as it is, and it's an outpatient surgery, it can be done in a matter of a few hours and one day, you're back home and on your way. There's a doctor in India, and he started a, a nonprofit or charitable organization where he's provided for and organized over 200 of these cataract surgeries for the poorest children from all the regions in India. And he tells a story, he gives an example of what the recovery is from a cataract surgery. And he talks about one teenage boy who he says just finished the surgery, a doctor had finished the procedure, done all the post-surgery checks, starts to remove the bandage, and the boy's sitting down, and he starts to kind of blink profusely. He's looking around. But as soon as the light reflects off of his eyes, it becomes obvious, and especially when the doctor begins to ask him questions, that he can't see clearly. Everything is blurry. It's like there's a filter. He, he sees shapes and objects and, and reflections and light, but he can't identify any of these shapes or objects or colors. And the reason for that is because the eyes, the new lens, takes time. The, see, the eye is connected to the brain. And what doctors and scientists have realized is that your brain needs to actually learn to interpret what the eyes are seeing. So in the case of this boy, post-cataract surgery, He's seeing light, he's seeing colors, he's seeing shapes, and it's being filtered through his retina, 
sorry, through his pupil and his cornea, and it goes all the way to the back of the eye, which is the retina, and that sends the signal to the, the optic nerve in the brain, which then interprets the light that the eyes are seeing as images. But those need to be learned. And if you've never learned what those images are, if you've never seen them before, it's hard to identify. It takes time for the brain to learn. It's the same thing even with what they call stereo vision, which is part of seeing. You have two eyes. And so the same scenario is where the light reflects off of each eye, so you're seeing two slightly different images, and now your brain needs to interpret them into one image, one precept, and this takes time. The mind needs to learn that. So though this surgery is very effective at, at curing blindness caused by cataracts, it takes time to actually regain your vision back. It's not instant. Your brain needs to process what it's seeing and learn those new images again. And it's kind of what we see this morning in Jesus' healing of this blind man in Bethsaida. Right? The man's vision comes back in two stages. It's fuzzy at first and then full at last. And you're probably wondering, why two stages? Why only in this time, on all the miracles we have recorded on the pages of Scripture, in all four of the Gospels, why is this the only two-stage miracle? I mean, couldn't have Jesus just healed him instantly, like he had time and time again with so many other diseases and illnesses? Like he's healed other blind people, and we're going to see in chapter 10, like he heals Bartimaeus and other blind men instantly? And the answer is yes, overwhelmingly. Of course he could have. But it doesn't answer the question, why then two stages? And I think the only answer is this. When you consider the immediate context of the story that precedes this, about the disciples' blindness and their failure to see Jesus for who he is and know him, and his severe rebuke of them because of it, I think he's using this as an illustration and as a parable for his listening and for his watching disciples his heart of hearing and his heart of seeing blind disciples so that they can see that just as Jesus heals this blind man now in two phases, gradually, slowly, so from this point on is he going to heal their spiritual sight for the rest of the gospel and actually give them eyes to see him, which is to say, give them understanding to know him. It's a picture of that. It's a picture of that. And that's exactly why Jesus does it in two stages. And I don't think this story of Jesus healing this blind man in this most unusual, gradual, progressive way, it doesn't do its job if you just focus on Jesus trying to show the disciples what he's going to do for them and their spiritual eyes and their spiritual sight. You know, it doesn't do its job unless you and I see ourselves in here, too, in our own spiritual blindness. The fact that we haven't arrived, we haven't arrived when we were first saved and converted and regenerated. Yes, we, we see him, we saw him savingly, and we believe, but we haven't arrived. We don't know everything there is about Jesus on the pages of, of Scripture perfectly. No, I think the text and this story does its job when we see ourselves here and our own blindness, and know that we too are in this process whereby gradually Jesus is revealing himself more and more to us, and we need it. We need him to take us by the hand like he does this blind man and to show himself to us more and more. And just like we're going to see him do to his disciples for the rest of the gospel. And before we jump into the story, since we've arrived at such a critical juncture, this is a bridge in Mark's gospel, I want you to keep a few things in mind. We're at the halfway point. Acts 1 is over. We've seen the first act where Mark presents Jesus as this miracle-working Messiah in Galilee. 
And, and now we're about to enter the second part of Mark's gospel. The second part where it's all about now the Jesus as the suffering servant who now came to die a sinner's death and to pay a ransom for many. It's no longer about the miracles of Jesus. In fact, from here on in, we're only going to see two more. We're going to see him cast out a demon, an exorcism in Mark chapter 9, and then we're going to see him heal another blind man, Bartimaeus, at the end of chapter 10. But that's it. And that's it for his public ministry as well. He's not going to come back to Galilee anymore. He's not going to perform more signs and miracles to prove his divine identity as the son of God and his divine origin being sent from God. No, now he's going to show them a different way. He's not a mighty, militant Messiah who's going to conquer and knock off the Romans. No, he's going to show them the suffering servant who came to die. And the rest of the gospel of Mark, this second act, is going to focus on his journey from here on in, slowly, as he moves towards Jerusalem and the Via Dolorosa and the cross. And it's interesting, within this section, starting with this story, the healing of a blind man, there's also a mini section in this kind of second half, this bridge. And that's on discipleship. Since he's no longer focusing on people in public, and we're going to see Jesus do that more purposefully and explicitly, trying to evade the crowds, hide away from them, and take private time of instruction and training with his disciples, there's a mini section here from 822 to 1052. And they're both capped by healing miracle, two specific healing miracles of two blind men. Interestingly enough, kind of like an inclusio here. They, they bookend this whole section on discipleship. Where he's going to gradually start opening up the disciples' eyes, just like he opened up this blind man's eyes, and just like he's going to open up Bartimaeus in chapter 10, 52. It's thematic. And Mark is actually the only gospel writer, the only evangelist who records these two miracles. And they have so much... In common, they're very similar in the details that Mark records and the way he tells the story, and we're going to see that as we dive into the text. They're unique to him. And so we've reached this juncture, this halfway point. And I want you to notice, and you will notice as the weeks go on, how Jesus is going to reveal himself to his disciples. Not the mighty miracle worker of Galilee anymore, no. The suffering servant who came to give his life, and three times in this next section alone on discipleship, as he spends this private time talking to and teaching and training his disciples, he's going to predict his death and his resurrection. Three times. In 831, 931, and 1033. This is who he wants them to know he is. And this is what he wants them to know his kingdom message and his kingdom program is all about. The cross. And so now we jump into chapter 8, verse 22. But before we do that, to give you a, a quick contextual recap, wh where are we? In chapter 8, Jesus, we saw at the beginning, he just fed the 4,000. This time it's a, it's a bunch of Gentiles in the Decapolis on the eastern Gentile shore. He fed them. And then he crosses over back to the western Jewish shore, he lands in Dalmanutha, the region of Magdala or Magadon, and he's immediately confronted by these Pharisees, the Pharisees in Galilee, who want another sign. Jesus says, I've had it with you. I've given you tons of signs. I ain't given you any more signs. If you don't believe by now, you never will. And he leaves them. He pronounces judgment on them, and he physically leaves them, gets back in the boat to cross back to the eastern Gentile shore. And on that boat ride, the disciples are talking about bread. And Jesus says, you don't need to be worried about what you're going to physically eat. Seriously. You just saw me feed 4,000. You know I fed 5,000 not too long ago. You need to be worried about the leaven of the Pharisees. That kind of willful, hard-hearted unbelief and rejection and opposition to me. 
and they didn't get it. And he rebukes them for their severe blindness. But there's a different blindness in the Pharisees. The Pharisees is willful, theirs is ignorant. It's not that they don't want to believe, they, they just don't know at this point. Right? They're his disciples. He chose them to follow him. They're with him everywhere he goes and have been for two years now. It's a different kind of ignorance. It's a salvageable ignorance and unbelief, if you will. And that's why Jesus ends that section on the note of, do you not yet understand? After he gives them that rhetorical interrogative rebuke asking them seven, eight questions, one after another. Do you not yet, and the operative word is yet, showing that there's still hope for these disciples. There's still hope in the future that they will yet believe. And now we're in verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. So we're in Bethsaida, on the eastern Gentile shore, the northeastern shore of Galilee there, where actually the Jordan River flows into it. Bethsaida, Bethsaida literally means the house of the fisher. It was a fisherman's town, a fishing town, small town in lower Golanitis, which is part of the Tetrarchy of Philip, one of the four sons of Herod the Great. When he died, he split the kingdom, his kingdom, up into four quadrants, four tetrarchies, and this is Philip's. And if the name Bethsaida sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you're remembering it from Mark 6.45, right? Right after he fed the 5,000 plus, Mark says that's where Jesus intended to go with the disciples. But then they got on the boat and a storm hit, and actually they ended up probably because of the wind and the seas and everything else in Gennesaret, he says in verse 6.53. And actually... Incidentally, Bethsaida is the hometown of three of his disciples, Peter, Andrew, and Philip. And we know that because John, in his gospel, tells us that. And if Bethsaida still sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you remember Jesus' woe pronouncements, his judgment pronouncements that Matthew and Luke record, both of them, against Chorazin and Bethsaida because of their unbelief. He says, woe to you. Even as sinful and evil as the Phoenicians, the, the Gentiles, Tyre and Sidon, if they would have seen the miracles that I've done for you, even they would have repented, he says. So woe to you. Judgment is coming. That's Bethsaida. Jesus is in this unrepentant, unbelieving city that is uninterested in him. Uninterested in him, unbelieving in him, isn't convinced by his miracles, and they've seen plenty. And yet there's a believing remnant, isn't there? This, this they. There's a believing remnant. This they, just like we saw in chapter 7 when he healed the, the deaf mute. We don't know who this they are, but it's a group of people who brought the deaf mute to Jesus, and just like also in chapter 2, a, a group of people who brought the paralytic to Jesus when they laid him in a basket through the roof. This they again. We're not given their names. We don't know much about them other than they care about this man. They care about him enough to bring him to Jesus. And when I talk about them being a believing remnant, I'm not necessarily suggesting they're saved. I don't know that they knew enough about Jesus to know him as Savior and Lord. What I'm saying is they know something about Jesus. And rightfully so, according to Matthew and Luke, Jesus has been doing a lot of miracles in this area. They've seen what he can do. They know exactly what Jesus is capable of. Stories have spread certainly everywhere throughout that area. And they believe that Jesus has the power to heal this man. Otherwise, they wouldn't have brought him to him. Right? And so they bring the blind man to Jesus, this they, because they care. They obviously care about him. Is he their brother, their son, their father, their friend? We don't know, but they care. They care enough about him to bring him 
to the one that they know for a fact has supernatural healing power. They've seen it with their own eyes. They've heard the reports of it with their own ears. And they bring him to Jesus. Because they're tired of seeing him eke out this living as a blind man, as a beggar. And that's what life was like being blind in that ancient Near Eastern context. If you had friends and family that cared about you, in the morning they would take you by the hand and lead you out to your specific designated corner on the street where you would be there every day. Everyone in the city would know you. This was your corner and differentiate you from all the other if there was other blind beggars in the area. And you'd beg for food, for money, for scraps. And then at the end of the day, they'd again take you by the hand and, and lead you home and take care of you. And the next morning it would start all over again. This was your life. At best, if you had no family and friends, you were just on the street 24-7, begging, blind, with a walking stick, finding your way, trying to find your way around, trying to survive and get enough food to eat. This was a miserable life. It doesn't get lower than that. And they see Jesus. They see Jesus, they know what he's capable of. They don't know if they'll ever get another opportunity. And so they seize this one and they bring the man to Jesus and they beg him, he says, to touch him. To touch him. Jesus often heals by touch. In the Gospel of Mark, we've been seeing that. People know. Whether it was those who knew he had power and they desperately tried to, to just touch the hem of his garment, like the woman with the 12 year bleeding in chapter 5. Or when Jesus actually touches them and lays his hand on them like he did with the leper, an unclean, like he did with Jairus' daughter, unclean. They know that all they have to do is touch Jesus or be touched by Jesus. And so they come begging. Teacher, we know who you are. We've seen you heal in our town, the sick, the lame, We've seen you give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the mute, and we've heard crazy reports even about you raising people from the dead. And we're desperate. Our friend has no other option. There is no one else that can help him. We're begging you. Would you please? Would you please touch him? Lay your hand on him, and we know he'll be healed. And how did Jesus respond? Verse 23. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? Unbelievable, Jesus. What is going on here? First, you gave the deaf mute man in chapter 7 a massive divine wet willy, and now you're spitting in this guy's eyes? This blind man's eyes. This is outrageous. That's an insult. To us in our day, it is. We, know, we know that. You can't spit in someone's face. But to them, it was actually the complete opposite. We remember back in chapter 7, we talked about that in that ancient Near Eastern context. They had a lot of mystical beliefs between the Jews and non-Jews, actually. And they believed that spittle, particularly the spittle of a powerful person, a revered person, a respected person, had sometimes medicinal and sometimes magical powers to heal. Okay, so what are you saying, Sebastian? I get that. You're telling me that, that Jesus is now using mystical, magical fleshly, carnal methods to heal this guy, to perform some of his healings? No, I'm not saying that at all. We're going to see that. Jesus used the power of his person that he's going to execute in the power of his touch. He's not using magic, and he's not using mysticism. What I'm saying is, I think Jesus sometimes accommodated his self-revelation to the methods and modes that were known to the people of his day. I think he sometimes spoke to them 
in ways that they would understand or should understand. I know the parables are enigmatic, but they should have understood them. He used common analogies, earthly from everyday life, agricultural, household, familial, all these things that, in ways that he spoke to them. They should have got it. This is how he was accommodating himself in language that they understand. And I think the same is true with his miracles sometimes. And particularly in a Gentile context, which for sure was immersed in all sorts of paganism and mysticism and these kinds of weird potions for healing, including blindness and methods like this. You remember, I told you the story about the emperor Vespasian, who two Roman historians, Tacitus and Suetonius, they told the story of a blind man who, who went to him, and because he's an emperor, he's powerful, he's revered, he's respected, he's a god, the blind man begged Vespasian to spit on his eyes so he could see. And he did. But it didn't work, of course, because he doesn't have divine miracle working power. So I think Jesus is just communicating with them in a way that they can relate to, to have some sort of analogy with him, even if not an adequate understanding or knowledge of him and his methods at all. And what else do you notice about this? Kind of like the deaf mute man in chapter 7, and there's a lot of parallels and similarities in the details here, not the least of which, of course, is the divine wet willy and the spitting in the eyes. He takes, it's a private healing. So he takes the man by the hand, and he takes him outside of the city, outside of the village. He's saying, woe to Bethsaida. They've seen enough miracles, and if they don't believe by now, they'll never believe. And on that day of judgment, their unbelief is going to be on their heads. I'm not doing this for them. This is for you. You and your friends and my disciples follow me outside of the city. And he takes them by the hand, and he takes them outside of the city. Whether he, he spits on his hands directly and then touches his eyes, kind of like he did with the deaf mute man. Remember, he put, he put his fingers in his ears, and then he spit on his hands and touched his tongue because it was actually, it wasn't that he was deaf, he was mute. He couldn't speak because he was deaf. Remember, they're very closely connected. If you're deaf, you can't speak because you can't hear sound. So whether he spits in the guy's eyes directly this time or just applies it to his hand like this, that's irrelevant. The point is, he does it, and then he asks him, do you see anything? End of verse 23. And verse 24, the man responds, and he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. I see something. It's blurry. I can't see clearly. They kind of look like trees, but I know they can't be trees because trees don't walk, so they must be people. He's probably seeing the disciples who are in and around him and his friends, right? This is a private miracle. Nobody's there. People are vertical, just like trees. It's blurry images. He's just kind of expressing what he sees. Interestingly, kind of like the post-cataract surgery symptom, where you can't recognize shapes and colors and objects clearly. Maybe this is exactly what caused this man's blindness to begin with. It was cataracts. And the very fact that he describes what he's seeing or failing to see as trees and people goes to show that at one point in life he probably could see, couldn't he? Otherwise, how would he know what trees are and what they look like and what people are and what people look like? Which makes his situation all the more tragic, doesn't it? I can only imagine how hard it would be and you can only imagine with me how hard it would be to be born blind. I think out of all the senses that you could not have or that one might not have, between seeing and hearing, right, touch, smell, taste, sight, and hearing, I think seeing is by far the worst. Because you're on your own. You're completely helpless. 
In fact, the only thing worse than being born blind is probably being born with perfect eyesight and seeing and living your life through your childhood, through your adolescence and your teenage years, maybe even into adulthood, and then suddenly that gets taken away from you. That's hard. That's hard to accept. In verse 25. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, after the second step, Jesus touches his eyes again, and he's emphatically healed. He kind of repeats it three times, right? It says, his eyes are open, his sight is restored, and he sees everything clearly. And actually, the English doesn't even fully bring it out. How many times Mark uses words and phrases related to seeing or vision or eyes? He is emphasizing. This man saw nothing before, and now his eyesight is 20-20. Being legally blind, I think, is 20 over 200. Now this is 20-20. He can see everything near. He can see everything far. He can see anything and everything. Colors, the whole spectrum, the whole rainbow, objects, shapes, sizes, you name it. It's all back. And so knowing how terrible it would have been to have had your eyes once before, your eyesight, and then losing it, and then receiving it again, can you imagine the fullness of joy this man is experiencing in this moment? If you could be a fly on the wall in that scene, him and his friends, over the moon, tears of joy, laughter, crying out, groveling at his feet, squeezing Jesus almost to death. And rightfully so. We can understand that. This is Jesus, the great physician, the only ophthalmologist who has a 100% success rate with his cataract surgery and every other procedure that he performs and heals. His healings are perfect, undeniable. And even if not instant, it's not because he doesn't have the power to affect them instantly. It's because he has a different purpose, as in this case. So what is that purpose, then? We're going to look at that in a minute, but back to the joy that this man and his friends are experiencing, probably can't wait to tell everyone. Just like the deaf mute man earlier, can't wait to shout it out and tell the world what Jesus has done for him. But verse 26, Jesus sent him home saying, do not even enter the village. Which means the man probably lived on the outskirts somewhere, maybe in the countryside of Bethsaida, not actually in the town center, the highly populated, where a huge concentration of people were, saying, no, don't go there. You go to your home. Don't go to the city. I don't want you to tell anyone about this. This is between me and you and your friends and my disciples. And it's not unlike when Jesus told Jairus to keep silent when he raised his daughter from life. Or when he told the leper to keep silent and not tell anyone what Jesus did for him. And he does that sometimes in Mark's gospel. And he does that because Jesus, in his omniscience, knows everything. He knows exactly when to silence someone and who to silence if it's going to detract from his ministry. If it's somehow going to lead to an uproar and a crowd of people who try to lift him up as this conquering, militant Messiah who's going to divide and conquer and knock off the Romans before his appointed time. No, he doesn't want that. That's not his mission. That's not his prerogative. And so sometimes he silences people, knowing probably that that's what it would lead to if he didn't. And so why the two-stage healing? Tell me, Sebastian, why couldn't Jesus have just healed him right off the bat, like he's done so many times before, time and time again? He's God. He can do anything he wants. 
He possesses divine, supernatural power. He calmed the wind and the stormy sea in a word. He raises the dead with a touch. He casts out legions of demons with a word. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. He did it to show his watching disciples. He did it to show his watching disciples that just as he opened this blind man's eyes, so would he open their blind eyes to see him and to know him from here on in, slowly and gradually. And it's a picture for them. It's a picture of progressive revelation. And it's a picture for us, for disciples then, his 12, and for us, isn't it? I mean, we don't understand everything there is to know about Jesus and his kingdom program and the gospel and all the implications on the Christian life as recorded on the pages of Scripture, do we? Can anyone honestly say they've arrived to that? I know I can't. We don't understand everything. It's a process of gradual growth and maturity and understanding. And it starts at the moment of salvation, when we're converted, when we're regenerated, when God from heaven above grants us faith by his spirit, causes us to understand our own sinfulness and our own desperate need for a savior and convinces us that that savior is Jesus and we trust in him. We see him for the first time. And then he continues enabling us to see him more and more by the spirit he's given us as we spend time with Jesus, which is to say as we spend time with the people of Jesus, his church, his body. And we listen to the word taught about Jesus. And we pray to Jesus. And we sing about Jesus. And we proclaim the gospel about Jesus to the world. And as we do all of these things, what happens? He grows us more and more. He increases our spiritual eyesight. And as we see him more and more, and we get to know him more and more, we get to loving him more and more. Our affection for him, our adoration for him grows more and more. And for his people, for his church, whom he purchased with his own blood, and, and that's discipleship. And the focus is on he. He does this growing, this maturing, this seeing, this enabling work in us. We have to do our part certainly to work it out, but he does it. That's the Christian life. That's discipleship. Growing, maturing, being formed more into the image of Christ and seeing him. And it lasts for the rest of your life. It doesn't stop. And even by the end of our life, we're not going to see him perfectly. Make no mistake. Whoever claims that in this life, the greatest theologian, the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher you can imagine or have read about in church history cannot claim honestly to know Jesus perfectly and see him perfectly. Not in this life. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, doesn't he? He says, we see like in a dimly lit mirror, in part. But when we're with him face to face, then we'll see him and know him just as we now are fully known, he says. Only in eternity. Once we reach glory with him and we're with him and we see him face to face, then we'll truly see him and know him perfectly, just as he fully knows us now, but only then. And this idea of blindness to sight is a common metaphor in the Bible, Old Testament and New, of of, of spiritual darkness and spiritual light. Right? If you're blind, you're in spiritual darkness and unbelief. 
unregenerate. And, and if you see, you're in spiritual light. You believe. You see Jesus. You see him and know him in a saving way, and you trust him as Savior and Lord. But for those that don't, It's not because Jesus doesn't want you to see him or believe in him. It's because for whatever reason, whatever your circumstances, you haven't. And you're still in the darkness. You're still blind. And he wants you to see him. But he won't force you to see him. He wants you to come to him willingly. He wants you to want to see him. And his promise is for all those who come seeking him sincerely and want to know him and who he is and experience his saving power, he will reveal himself to you. And he'll rescue you from your sin. He'll illuminate you. He'll give you his light. But you have to come. You have to want to come. You have to ask. He's calling you this very moment. Some of you probably recognized the title of the sermon from a song. And that's because I I did borrow it from a song and slightly changed it to fit the message of this text. An old song by an American singer-songwriter, reggae, pop singer-songwriter, which came out in 1972, right? I can see clearly. And it's been covered by tons of artists ever since, hugely popular and successful, number one hit. And in the chorus, he, he says that. He says, I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. And it was a bright, bright, sunshiny day for this blind man, wasn't it? Those dark clouds that had prevented him from seeing were gone. Jesus removed those obstacles of a destroyed lens by cataracts or whatever it was. But you know what? For those who believe, like you and like me, Jesus has done so, so much more. Because he's removed the dark clouds and the obstacles which previously kept us in unbelief. Right? Our our pride, our hard-heartedness, our ignorance, our selfishness, whatever it was, all obstacles gone. And the dark cloud of our sin is no longer hanging over our heads because it hung with him on the cross. And so for us, every day is a bright and sunshiny day in life. Because we as believers alone have the hope of an eternity of enjoying bright and sunshiny days with Jesus in his kingdom, in his presence, in his light forever. Join me in a word of prayer.